Well, hi there, everybody. Um, I'm here today with Esther Smith. I am Melissa Affalter, and um, I have invited Esther to spend some time with me talking about uh, a particular topic that I think is really important to the work that we do with counseling, specifically people who've experienced trauma or other trauma-related impacts. And um, I, we're going to tell you a little bit about ourselves first, just briefly, and then we're going to walk through some common questions related to the topic of EMDR. And so I'm really excited about spending this time with you, Esther. Um, we had compiled some questions in advance, just common questions that I specifically hear, um, and then you were able to kind of confirm which, which aspects of those would relate to your work. And so for those of you who don't know me, um, again, my name is Melissa Affalter. I am a counselor, a biblical counselor, have been counseling for uh, a little over a decade, and the last several years work full-time at Fieldstone Counseling in Northeast Ohio. Um, one of the primary things that motivated me to reach out to Esther and, and want to have this conversation is that I do a lot of group work, uh, specifically a group called Restoried, where I meet with women who've experienced abuse and trauma. And we do some group um, story work related to their experiences of abuse and trauma. And oftentimes, as you can imagine, in a group setting like that, those women ask questions that maybe they don't feel comfortable asking anywhere else because they've either just felt awkward about it or um, don't really want to share the details of their history with people that they don't know or feel comfortable with. And so Restoried really gives people this kind of safe and comfortable environment where they can not only think about their story um, specifically, but even their ongoing journey of healing and trying to process things. And so one of the questions that comes up every time in the six years that I've been running those groups is what about things like EMDR? Um, a lot of the women either don't understand it or perhaps they've um, had things they've heard about it or read about it from different places, but they're just a little apprehensive to know what is it and would it be helpful? Maybe it's been recommended to them, but they still feel cautious um, because of just the lack of understanding. And so Esther is kind enough to meet me for these few minutes and just talk through, yeah, an overview of EMDR and then a few specific questions related to trauma. So thank you, Esther. And I'm going to let you just introduce yourself briefly, and then we'll kind of dive into these questions. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, thank you so much for having me. I was very excited when you suggested um, doing this because I do think it is such an important topic. There's a lot of people who have questions about EMDR um, and will just kind of search around on the internet. And I think it's hard to find um, good information about it. So I'm excited to be here and answer some common questions. Um, I have been practicing EMDR for about um, the last three years at this point. And I have found it to be such a, um, just such a great tool. Um, we'll get more into what EMDR is in a bit. It does stand for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And we'll talk about more about that in a bit. Um, but yeah, it is a tool that I use with people who have experienced trauma among other um, common um, challenges that people come to counseling for. Um, I have been counseling also for about the past decade. So I think we must have started counseling about the same time. Um, and so I have a clinical um, counseling degree um, as well as training in biblical counseling. Um, and then more recently, I started just really focusing in on trauma, um, trauma related counseling, um, which really is something that I started focusing on after I got the training in EMDR. Um, and so that is really the focus of my counseling work and my practice. I own a counseling practice called Christian Trauma Counseling, where I just work mostly with people who have a history of trauma. And um, 
that is just, I would say my focus and my passion in counseling right now is really helping people to bring together that biblical counseling side, that clinical counseling side, um, all from this trauma-informed, biblically faithful perspective um, to help people as they're healing from trauma. Mm, thanks for that explanation. I think even just hearing a little bit more of your specific background and how you're incorporating those things um, in your practice in counseling um, just reminds me again why I wanted to have this conversation because I do think um, it's so painfully difficult for people who've experienced trauma to find resources or help that they know is going to not only address their particular needs, but as Christians, they're wanting to, you know, think through that biblical worldview. And when they feel like there's any kind of conflict, either in their own minds about it or things that people are telling them that can just feel really distressing to them. And when you already have a trauma background, that additional distress um, can just multiply those concerns, I think. So I'm looking forward to hearing more of your thoughts. Um, just to kind of start us off, I know you gave us um, a, a quick flyby kind of, of what the, the initials for EMDR represent, but tell us a little bit more, what is the basic premise of EMDR? Um, and maybe even tying in with that, like the general history of how it started and kind of where it is today. Yeah, so I can just give you just a, a basic general overview. Um, so EMDR, again, it stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. Um, and it is a specific approach to counseling that was originally designed to help people process past painful memories, past distressing experiences, really past traumatic incidents that were still affecting them in the present. Um, so the person who created EMDR, her name is Francine Shapiro. Um, she originally created it back in 1987, so it is a newer therapy. And there is kind of an interesting story about how she created it. I won't get into all of it, but basically she was like walking through a park and she made this connection that as she was like moving her eyes and doing these eye movements while thinking about some distressing memories that she had had, she realized that some of her emotions connected to those memories started to just calm down, started to be less than they were before. Um, so she started experimenting with her idea and what she found on other people. And over the years, she turned it into um, a protocol that follows um, steps step-by-step -step protocol um, to help people with processing past traumatic incidents. Um, so I think one of the helpful ways to, to kind of explain what EMDR is exactly is to go through like each one of those parts of the name. So it kind of starts with this idea of eye movements, which literally is talking about moving your eyes back and forth like from side to side like that. Um, if you could see, if you could see me doing that on the screen, you're just moving your eyes back and forth. And um, those eye movements are a type of bilateral stimulation. So bilateral stimulation is any sort of stimulation that's going to alternate between the right and the left side of your body. Um, so another type of bilateral stimulation would be just like tapping like this on both sides of your body. Um, another type would be like auditory um, sounds, um, alternating from ear to ear. Those are all types of bilateral stimulation. And that is the mechanism that EMDR uses to use some sort of bilateral stimulation while thinking back on a past event that's still affecting you um, in the present. And um, I use different types of bilateral stimulation with people, um, but the, the name specifically, it starts with that eye movements, one type of bilateral stimulation. Um, and that talks about desensitization, eye movement desensitization. And that's referring to the way that EMDR can help desensitize physical and emotional responses to trauma that continue into the present. So after you do EMDR, a lot of people will think and feel differently about what happened and that emotional, physical, bodily response to what happened will start to come down as there's that desensitization sort of effect. Um, and then there's that final word, reprocessing. So it's the eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. Um, and that's the other 
the other effect that EMDR can have is that as you think back on these past traumatic incidents, your trauma story, it helps you reprocess the trauma story um, by consolidating the memories and then connecting the memories to important information. And as, as Christians, a lot of time that important information is this scripture focused or faith-based understanding of what happened. Um, because a lot of times when people experience trauma, there's like this separation between how you feel about what happened and what you know scripture says about what happened. Um, this is just one example. And so one way that people might process things is to kind of bring those two things together, to start thinking differently about what happened, feeling differently about what happened, um, and being able to apply what they know is true to the incident instead of those being separate, separate things. So that's kind of like a basic overview. Hopefully that kind of made sense. <laughs> yeah, um, it definitely made sense. I liked hearing, you know, the emphasis for each letter and giving more context for that. Um, and also really appreciate um just the small little view into how it started. Um, the the woman, what was her name again? Francine Shapiro. Francine Shapiro. Yeah. Um, I just find that really fascinating that what first cued her into wanting to research what was happening to her and kind of the connections she was making that that started with her going on walks. Um, mm. uh, it just immediately for me ties in with as a Christian thinking about creation and just the way that nature and creation and being out in the created world does have such a healing and restorative impact. Um, yeah. So I, I just think even that part is really fascinating to me that that was what first prompted her to want to dive into that a bit further and kind of develop her ideas. So yeah, that's interesting. I had not thought about that, about how that's like when the idea first came to her. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to read too much into it knowing <laughs> what was going on for her, but I just think of how for me personally, and a lot of people that I meet with, um, in counseling, how much nature can be a really important space for them when they're trying to process really hard things and find, um, a different path. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, a few of the more specific questions that we're going to talk through um, are going to just build on what you've already shared, but one that um, that I've heard in different variations from people when they're maybe hearing from their friends, because let's face it, with counseling, a lot of times people hear about things from a friend or someone at their church or somebody who gives them, you know, or social media, they read about, you know, things. And so one that. I wanted to kind of spend a few minutes talking through is just sometimes when we hear about someone doing something like EMDR, they might express having dark moods or feeling kind of overwhelmed with what they're processing after one of their sessions where they've had EMDR. Is that something that typically happens after EMDR or, um, and I know it might be hard to quantify that. Um, but if so, what would the follow-up for that look like to help that person process? Because I think where those kind of questions are rooted is really just fear. Sometimes, you know, we feel mm -hmm. apprehensive about trying something that if, if it's going to result in, you know, more processing that feels painful and hard, then do I really want to do that? Yes, that is a very understandable question, a very good question to ask. Um, and you know, there's so many different variables, um, so many variables. And I have like so many questions for the person who's asking that question to be able to, to determine the answer. Right. So I'll just give you a couple different thoughts, um, kind of that might be different for different people. Um, so the first thing is that, um, it could be, it could be an absolutely fine and normal response for someone who has done EMDR, um, to have, um, to have, oh, there's so many, there's so many variables, right? I'm trying to think exactly where to start. So it's absolutely normal to have a lot to process after EMDR. I can say that for sure. Um, doing EMDR is very hard work. Your brain is working very hard during the processing session. And once you 
leave the counseling appointment, your brain doesn't just instantly shut off that processing. Your brain is going to keep processing stuff between sessions. So it's one of the things that I actually always tell people is pay attention. Like, what do you notice between now and the next time we meet? Are you noticing any new thoughts, any new feelings, any new memories, any new dreams? Um, and people come back the next session and pretty much like they're, they always notice something. There's something new that comes up because your brain is processing things between the sessions. So absolutely, almost everybody's going to have additional processing between sessions that's happening. Um, a lot of people also feel very exhausted and very tired after a processing session. Um, and that, I mean, sometimes like feeling tired, I think can contribute to having like a low mood. Um, so someone might have a low mood connected to being very tired after the processing. Um, I think where it's, where I start to wonder, mm, would we expect this to happen is thinking about someone who has like a very dark mood after processing. Like my first question is like, how long? How long is that lasting after the session? Um, I, I do have people that I work with who will say like that evening or maybe into the next day, they're like, they're struggling, but then they kind of move out of it. And that I, th that, that I think can be normal. You're kind of pushing the person to work through some difficult stuff. So that stuff does come up and then you kind of help them regulate at the end of the session, but there's still some residual stuff. Um, and as long as the person feels like they're able to tolerate that and it's not disrupting um, their work, it's not disrupting their ability to engage with their family, then I think that that's okay. Um, but what can happen is that if you go too fast with the with the EMDR, if you push someone too hard with the processing, or if you start too soon, then people can um, go into a dark mood that's persisting from one session to the next. And that's when I start to get a little bit concerned and feel like mm, we're going too fast. Um, we need to kind of pull back a little bit with the processing because I don't want to destabilize people. I don't want to put people in a mood that's like persisting um, and getting worse. Um, I have worked with people where um, that will start to happen and we have to recalibrate um, and go back to um, helping them with some coping skills, helping them build up some positive resources, going to maybe like um, helpful scriptures before we process the negative thing that happened. Um, process some positive things before we process the negative thing. So all that to say, I think that if you're hearing stories from somebody who did EMDR and they're like, oh my gosh, it made me worse probably what happened is that they got pushed too fast with the EMDR. That sh it shouldn't happen that the EMDR makes you makes you worse. You might feel like a, a worse mood for, like I said, a few hours or maybe a day, but if it's like persistently pushing you in a negative direction, um, then I would say the processing is going at a speed that is too fast for you to manage and it should be pulled back. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that to happen if the processing was happening appropriately. Does I, and hopefully that brings some, you know, some comfort, I think, in trying it. Yeah. And it makes a lot of sense, Esther, because it, um, it really tracks with, even though I obviously, as someone who's not licensed, I'm not practicing EMDR, but even what I see in my groups, um, because they're engaging for that solid hour, hour and 15 minutes with material that relates to their story. There, there's times where they're sharing elements of their story. There's times where we're looking at various um, scripture passages and kind of connecting those into their story um, and kind of drawing out some things. Obviously in a group context, you know, you're all contributing different things, but even in those uh, meetings, I often have to, on the front end, prepare the women for transitioning from the time that we've spent in the group. So it sounds kind of similar in the sense of like, um, I've had women in the groups come back and say, uh, yeah, for a few hours after group, I felt really kind of queued up, kind of activated things were really present for me. Um, and that's where I had to put in some different strategies or techniques. Um, and I know, you know, you've not mentioned it in our prep for today. We're not here trying to like promote ourselves necessarily, but one tool that I use a lot 
in the groups for those types of transitional moments is your book. Um, I've recommended that a lot to the women. Um, and we've even done kind of samples from it just to model for them in the group, like, Hey, here are some ways that if the processing is feeling kind of distressing for you post group, what could you do? And so it sounds kind of similar in terms of that's where you would want a good counselor doing your EMDR with you so that they can read those cues and kind of say, we need to slow down or let's build in some other coping strategies to help you. Um, so it makes a lot of sense the way you're describing that and just what to like watch for if, if it's happening a lot or lasting too long, then that's where you'd want to be able to go back to your counselor and say, this is actually distressing for me. Yeah, absolutely. And that wouldn't necessarily mean you had to like stop doing EMDR. It just might mean that you need to go slower or you need to work more on the initial steps of the protocol, which are building up a lot of those skills that you were, you were talking about mm -hmm. to help people be able to regulate. That's good. That's really helpful. Um, the next couple questions kind of I think build well on this because again, we're addressing just sort of some of the complexities of what happens when there's been trauma and the way different people are going to be impacted in, in really different ways. And so one of those questions is um, related to complex PTSD. So is EMDR practiced differently if you're addressing complex PTSD as opposed to traditional PTSD? Yeah, I think, I think that's a good question. And so it's probably helpful to first like define what complex PTSD is. Um, probably two main differences between complex PTSD um, versus somebody who just would be diagnosed with um, PTSD. Um, one being that with complex PTSD, there's usually tr like repeated traumatic incidents over a period of time. So it's different than like a car accident where it just happens, there's just one incident. With complex PTSD, it's usually repeated incidents happening over and over and over again. Um, and the second main difference is that with complex trauma, it's usually, or not usually, it is in response to interpersonal threats. So there's like a person involved. Um, somebody is perpetrating the trauma. Um, so it's not like a natural disaster. It's more something like domestic violence or sex abuse or childhood neglect um, or something like that, where a person oftentimes is somebody that is close to you, somebody that you know is perpetrating the trauma over and over and over again is what you typically see with complex trauma. Um, so you can absolutely use EMDR with complex trauma. Um, and I would say it is a little bit different in a couple ways. Um, one is that it often is going to go slower. You're gonna really take your time, um, which I think is just a general rule of thumb when you're helping someone who has complex trauma, you just go really slow. Um, and so often there's this longer time frame needed to prepare before you process the past traumatic incidents. So um, EMDR has a number of different steps that come even before you use the eye movements to process the past trauma. Kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, about giving people skills. Um, in EMDR, we call it resourcing. You resource people by giving them um, information, by giving them scripture, by giving them truths, by giving them help finding community. There's all sorts of different ways that you resource people. And that process is going to be longer if you're working with someone who has complex trauma. Um, and then once you get to the part where you're actually doing the bilateral stimulation while thinking back on the traumatic incident, I think that the main difference there is that it can take some time to figure out, like, where do we start? If you have somebody who experienced hundreds of incidents of abuse as a child, then there's this question of, okay, like, what, what incident do I start with? What incident do I think back on while doing the processing? Um, and that's something that a counselor is going to be able to help you figure out. But I've just found that 
it can be more of a process of like figuring out, okay, what, what incident do we start with that's still affecting me today? Um, because the interesting thing that I have found is that it's not usually what I think it's going to be. People will kind of give me a history and they'll tell me about these terrible things that happened to them. And oftentimes it's an incident that to me doesn't seem like the, the, the worst incident. Um, oftentimes it's, it's something that for whatever reason stood out to them and really impacted them. Maybe an incident of being humiliated, an incident where um, somebody made them feel very small. Um, and yeah, it just, it's just so interesting. It always ends up being something I wouldn't have expected. Um, so that's part of the process of like going slow, like let's figure out like what's still really impacting you. It's all impacting you, but oftentimes there's like one or two key moments that people can think back on that are really feeding into feelings of worthlessness, feelings of, of something that's going on in the present. And it's kind of this this process of figuring out where to start. So in a lot of ways, it's the same. It's just slower, slower figuring out, preparing and figuring out where to start. Mm, yeah. That tracks with a lot of what I've seen in the trauma counseling I've done, but also what, what you've shared previously in the, in the previous questions um, particularly talking about the dark moods and things like that. So again, just that idea of slowness, I know, um, something we would probably both quickly ascribe as being accurate is most people, when they come in for any kind of counseling care that's connected to trauma, particularly repeated types of trauma or trauma over extended periods of time, um, it's natural to want to get past it as quickly as possible. You know, people come in and they're like, I just want relief. I want to feel better. I want to be able to do what I did before. I want to be able to move on, so to speak. Um, and then inevitably, you know, the common refrain as we go is usually there's a point where they will come back and acknowledge like, oh, what you said about needing to go slow. <laughs> actually made sense, you know? Um, and so that's where we as counselors obviously want to be empathetic and compassionate to say, yeah, it's, it's, it's normal and natural to want things to get better quickly, but this is for your good and for your benefit that, and for your ultimately, you know, part of the healing journey is going slow. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you were sharing about people coming in and just wanting to kind of push through, I definitely see that all the time because once people get to this point of like, okay, I'm going to do counseling, like they've made a decision, they come to do counseling and there really is this feeling of, okay, I've got to work hard. I'm just going to do this. I just want to feel better. Um, or maybe I have to feel worse to feel better. And it's, it's not quite like that. Like, yes, some stuff is going to come up, but you shouldn't like over time be like moving in a feeling worse direction, <laughs> which is going to happen if you don't go at a pace that your body and your mind and your soul can tolerate. You have to pace yourself and approach the traumatic material, approach the emotions, approach the sensations, everything at a pace that your body and all parts of you can tolerate and metabolize and work through. So yes, absolutely. I think it's such an important thing that you, that you shared. Yeah. Well, on a very related note, when we think about the person who maybe is continuing to experience trauma for whatever reasons, maybe it's, you know, one of the examples you gave of sometimes uh, what would fall into um, complex PTSD is someone who's maybe being abused or mistreated or neglected. Um, yeah, if, if someone's continuing to experience trauma, can EMDR be helpful even as they're continuing to experience that? Yeah. And this is another one of those questions where I'm like, it depends. And here are 20 different, you know, variables <laughs> that would help us understand this. Um, so I'll try to give you in a nutshell. Um, the nutshell is that you can in some situations, but it depends. 
Um, in some situations of ongoing trauma, you can do EMDR while the person is still going through the trauma. Um, there are actually specific protocols that are out there. So with EMDR, just to kind of like give some background information, there's like this standard protocol that was developed by Shapiro. Um, and then all these other counselors have created all these other protocols that are for different situations. So there's protocols for anxiety, there's protocols for OCD and even addictions and all sorts of things. Um, and so there is at least one protocol that I am aware of that is specifically for recent critical incidents and ongoing traumatic stress. Um, and I believe, I have not taken that specific training, but I believe it is for was originally designed for people going through um, natural disasters, people who are first responders. I think it's been used um, even for people who are going through the war in Ukraine. So mm -hmm. situations like that, they have found that it can be effective to do certain protocols while you're going through the ongoing trauma. Um, there is a group trauma processing protocol that you can do. That is something that I have been trained in. And that's another one. You, you can do that with people going through certain types of ongoing trauma. One way that I do that personally is with people who have like really severe chronic illnesses or chronic pain, and they're going through um, medical procedures and doctor's appointments and all sorts of medical type trauma that's like not in the past, it's present. And I do EMDR with people who are going through that and have found it to be, to be helpful. Um, so there's that, yes, you can. Um, in some situations, it's, it's going to get more tricky. Um, there's, there's other situations where I'd be much more cautious about doing EMDR with somebody going through ongoing trauma. So one prime example would be domestic violence. If somebody is in physical danger, I'm not going to do like EMDR bilateral processing with them. Um, could there be other parts of the EMDR protocol that I would do with them? I, yeah, I could, some of that resourcing part of it, but it's we're gonna be focused on keeping them safe, their actual physical, physical safety and everything else that's going to come um, with domestic violence, process, domestic violence counseling. Um, so it really, it really depends. That's one example where like, you know, I would be cautious. Although I, I have used EMDR with people who are in an oppressive marriage, that is not physically violent, where there's emotional and verbal and um, spiritual abuse. And I've done EMDR processing with them of past traumatic incidents that was extremely helpful for them in being able to respond to the current, the current abuse. So I have done that and it's been extremely effective, but it's one of those things that's going to be on a very, very case by case basis. Um, in terms of like, is it safe? Do they have enough resources to be doing that while they're in that situation? And sometimes the answer is no, but sometimes it's yes. And it can be, can be tricky to figure out. Um, but I would say that in most situations, you can do the components of the EMDR that are focused on building up people's resiliency, building up people's strength and faith. And I think one, I mean, one of the things that's like, important to keep clarifying is that EMDR is not just bilateral stimulation thinking back on the traumatic incident. It's all these other steps that come before that to prepare people for that. And a lot of those steps are going to be appropriate in most situations. Mm. That's really helpful. Um, because it's particularly, even though it's one of those questions, again, that like our answers sometimes might feel a little bit non-specific and so the person looking for an answer for their specific life circumstance that can feel difficult but i think that also is a is a great um transition to this next question because i think we would be uh, potentially harmful as helpers if we were to give specific answers in a way of saying well this will work every time with every situation um and so I think that's the beauty of talking about what does it look like to find a good EMDR therapist or a good counselor who's trauma informed. Um, and so I think a lot of that we've touched on in different ways as you've answered, but I would love to hear any, um, you know, sort of like 
all together thoughts that you might have summarizing what are some of the most helpful things to look for if you're trying to find a therapist who's um, adept at practicing EMDR? And also, yeah, are there any particular warnings that you would have for that? Yeah. Yeah. Finding someone who is adept at practicing EMDR. Um, I think one of the things, if we're, if we're looking specifically for an EMDR therapist, um, one of the things I'm curious about is, is just if they regularly use EMDR in their counseling sessions, uh, because you will find people who will, you know, list EMDR as something that they use in their profiles or bios. But I'm just, I would just be curious, like, how, how often do you use it? Is it a regular tool that you go to? Because it is something that you learn how to do as you practice it. Um, so there are counselors who get trained in it, but then just for whatever reason, rarely use it. Um, so for me personally, I would prob I would just want to go to somebody who um, got trained in it and then, you know, uses it all the time, right? Um, so one of the ways you can tell if somebody uses EMDR is if they're certified in it. So people can get certified in EMDR. Um, I am not personally certified. I did everything that you need to do to be certified. And I decided for a number of different reasons not to get certified. Um, but it's really those things you need to do to get certified that I would be interested in. And some of those things are, um, you have to have a certain number of hours um, working, doing EMDR sessions. You have to have consultation with people who have been doing EMDR longer than you, um, and you have to get continuing education and advanced trainings related to EMDR. Um, so you could look for somebody who's certified, or you could just kind of see, have has the person done those things? Do they get continuing education? Are they getting consultation? Are they using it regularly? Um, so for EMDR specifically, those are the things I'm, I'm kind of generally interested in. And then honestly, I think it's just some of those like basic things you're always going to look for in a counselor. Um, I, I would personally, it would be my preference. I would want to know, is the counselor a believer? Um, I would prefer to see an EMDR therapist who is a Christian and who has the same beliefs that I do. Um, and if they aren't, I would be wondering, do they still encourage you to bring your faith into the counseling process? Um, because it's ideal if you can find a Christian counselor who practices EMDR, but you might not be able to find that. Um, and I personally think that that can be okay. Um, in some situations, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend seeing a secular counselor for EMDR. Um, but generally, I think that if somebody has a firm faith foundation, if they if you feel like you're able to do some of that work yourself of bringing your faith into the counseling, maybe you're seeing a biblical counselor and you're getting EMDR and the biblical counselor is helping you kind of with that faith component. Um, I, I think it's okay. This is just my opinion. <laughs> I think it's okay to see an EMDR therapist who is not a Christian, but I would personally prefer someone who was. Um, and if they're not someone who's going to see your faith as in their terminology, they're going to see your faith as a resource, um, as part of that resourcing process, even if they don't have the same beliefs as you. Um, so I would look for that. Is the is the counselor a believer? Um, and then just generally speaking, do they listen to you? Do you feel cared for? Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel safe? Do you feel like you can say what you need to say without feeling judged? I think that is so, so, so key um, because that's what's going to give you the space you need to bring up the important stuff. If you don't feel safe, you won't bring it up. And if you don't bring it up, you won't be able to heal through it. Um, so some of those basic general counselor skills, like you need those in an EMDR therapist as well. It's not, it, it's not just this rote procedure. That relationship is still important. And so you have to feel that safe, sense of, of safety as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really helpful, um, distinctions. Um, and I, I know obviously different people are going to have different backgrounds and different experiences, but I know in all the, the years that I've been working with women, particularly in my support groups, um, I've had a wide variety of them share pretty similar to what you just gave some examples of where, Either they see someone for EMDR and then they're seeing um, someone specific to their biblical counseling needs. 
um, kind of in between, and they've actually found it really beneficial to then process some of what came up for them in the EMDR session. Um, and then also I've had some that have had really good experiences with people like yourself who are able to practice EMDR, but who also share in their faith perspective. Um, so I think just being able to take note of the options and knowing that sometimes there are limitations that we all face based on like geographical accessibility and all of those things. Um, so yeah, thanks for giving us maybe just a fuller picture of like what all is available. Um, I wanna wrap up our time really just by circling back to where we started when we just acknowledged that this conversation can be challenging because there's different pieces of information that we bring to the table when we come. There's assumptions that we might come with about a topic like this. There's a lot of variety of opinions and convictions and um, so much has, you know, in recent years, obviously been written about and talked about when people start thinking about how do I reconcile my faith or my biblical convictions with different forms of clinical care or what would be considered um, outside the scope of a biblical counselor for someone who's, you know, strictly a biblical counselor. So just generally, I'd love to hear your thoughts on when it feels confusing or challenging, what might be some helpful points to consider or places where there can be some, some clarification? Yeah. Yeah. It definitely is a concern for people, um, about EMDR. Is it, is this a biblical approach? If I'm a Christian, can I, you know, go get EMDR therapy just because it's helpful? Does that mean that it's okay? Right. So people have a lot of questions about that. Um, I'll give two different thoughts about how you might be able to think through that. Um, the first is that really one way to think about EMDR is that it is a neurological approach to counseling. It actually causes neurobiological changes in the brain. And I believe it causes changes in the brain that bring our bodies more closely in alignment with how God designed us to function. And we can actually see this on brain scans of people have a scan before they get EMDR and after EMDR. We can see that the after scan, their brain looks more like a healthy brain, more like God intended our brains to look like. Um, I'll give a couple of examples for people who are interested. This is kind of getting into some of the nitty gritty details. Um, but Primarily, EMDR was first created, designed for people who ha have experienced trauma. So let's say somebody who actually has a PTSD diagnosis. And one thing we know about people who have that diagnosis, if you look at their brain scans, you can see that there's something going on in the limbic system of their brain that's not quite right. So the limbic system that includes the amygdala, it includes the hippocampus, and these are structures that are associated with memory, with emotions, with the fight, flight, freeze response. Um, and so people who have PTSD, you can see on their brain scans, these structures are over-functioning. They're going crazy. Like the emotions, the, that, that trauma response, you can actually see that on the brain scan. And then we look at the after scans of somebody who has had EMDR treatment, and you see that there's decreased activation in that area. It comes down, you can actually see the difference. Their brains are more closely to how God designed our healthy brains. Um, so that's one example of what you can see on brain scans. I'll give you one other example. This is also for people who have a PTSD diagnosis. So we can see on their brain scans that if you compare them to a healthy control, there is something going on in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. There's decreased activity there. So with the limbic system, there was the increased activity, with, but with the prefrontal cortex, there's decreased activity. And this is the part of the brain that's associated with the higher level functions like cognition, impulse control, decision-making. That's all dampened for someone who has trauma. And then you look at the after scans of somebody after EMDR, someone who has trauma after DM EMDR, 
you see a similar thing that the prefrontal cortex functions have been normalized. There's increased activity now. It was one, it was dampened and then there's increased activity and more blood flow to this area. So it's again, there's this rebalancing of the functions of the brain that takes place throughout the course of EMDR treatment that really is proven by these before and after scans of the brain. Um, this more balanced functioning where the brains, the brain is in this place where distress is down, problem solving is up. It brings people to this place where they're more able to talk about the trauma, read scripture, pray, have relationships with people, have healthy, healthy coping skills. There's a lot of debate about the exact mechanisms of what is happening between this scan and that scan, right? But we, we can see that even if we don't 100% understand the mechanism, it's, it's bringing people to healthier places. So, I mean, that's one thing I say, I would say, I know that that was like a very in-depth explanation that some people are probably like, okay, I did not need all of that. But all that to say is that there is something neurological going on. It's, it's not much different than some other treatments that you might get that would have a neurological effect, a positive neurological effect on the brain. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that if you're having concerns about doing EMDR um, because of your Christian faith, I would say that if you're working with a Christian counselor who does EMDR, what I have found time and time again is that the EMDR is going to help you connect your experience with truth that God gives us. It's going to help you bring those things together. Um, there are actually a few key parts of the EMDR protocol that when I first learned them, I was like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe how well this fits in with biblical counseling. Like truly, truly, because one of the things that you get asked when you do EMDR every, every time, if, if someone's following a protocol, is that you think back on the trauma and you identify core negative beliefs you've developed about yourself related to the trauma. So for example, after the trauma, you might struggle with feeling like I'm unworthy, I'm unlovable, it's my fault, all these negative beliefs, all these untrue things that you're thinking about yourself. And then after you identify that, you're going to be asked, as you think about that incident, what would you like to believe about yourself instead? This is the negative thing you're believing. What do you want to believe instead? And this is the most wonderful opportunity to lead people towards scripture. Like it, there could not be a more perfect opportunity to help people connect the traumatic incident to what scripture says about who they are. And like, that's, that's the basis of so much biblical counseling <laughs> is being able to understand ourselves, our experiences, the people around us, God, where he was an experience from the light of scripture. And just using the EMDR protocol, using the questions as a guide, it just brings that in so naturally. Um, so the way that I do EMDR, um, it's emphasizing moving towards this biblically faithful gospel focused understanding of your experience and moving towards being able to consider, okay, what truths do you want to believe about yourself and about what happened to you? And we're not going to pull these truths out of thin air. We're going to look at scripture. We're going to look at what God says about you, what God says about what happened, what God says about who he is in light of what happened. Um, and it's this way of helping people connect the terrible things that happened to them to the redemptive work that God is doing in their lives. And it just works. Like I, I tell you, it just works. It fits in so naturally into the protocol. Um, so if you're working with a Christian counselor, they're going to be able to lead you in that direction. Mm. Thank you, Esther. Um, I, I know that that particular question could get talked about for hours and mm -hmm. it does get talked about a lot. Um, but what I really appreciate most in, in, in what you shared is that connection point. And I might not use the same wording, um, in the way that you were, um, just for lack of, you know, not remembering exactly what you said, but just this idea of 
it, it almost for a lot of people, and I've seen it in, in some of the people that I've worked with in counseling, who've received EMDR care, um, is there's a new capacity or an increased capacity for them to then be able to engage with scripture or to engage with who is God? Where is God? Where was he in my story? Um, and who am I? Um, you know, I've, I've heard multiple people come, come through those types of treatments and as they've continued to walk with me in counseling or in one of my groups, and they'll just say like, man, I just, it's, it's so unbelievable to me how now I feel more able to engage with those thoughts that at one point were distressing and disheartening and almost just impossibly complicated. And now I can kind of untangle those and make sense of those in a way that leads me back to my true identity and knowing who God is. And so I think that's um, a really helpful distinction that people oftentimes don't know about just because we can get caught up in when we're researching it or talking with people about it, we can just get caught so much up into like the debate factor rather than um, really just thinking through the lens of even just the Holy Spirit guiding us, um, you know, and he's promised to guide us into all truth. And so I think that's just a great way to conclude our thoughts on that by just saying we, we have to remember that that's the core of what we're doing when we're thinking about any kind of, you know, counselor or therapist or whatever kind of help that we're going to be receiving is that it's going to come from a human, which means it's not going to be infallible or without, um, you know, any earthly blemish. But if, if we're trusting the Holy spirit to guide us into all truth, he's not going to lead us into harm. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, thank you so much for just sharing those things as a way to wrap up. Um, I'd love to just let you kind of wrap us up by sharing maybe like if people have follow-up thoughts or just want to know a little bit of, more about how to stay connected, knowing that one conversation in this short time frame might not, you know, cover everything they were hoping for. Yeah. Feel free to kind of take that away. Yeah, absolutely. I really, I really, first of all, appreciated just all the sh thoughts that you shared um, just a second ago. And the last thing that I will add, you're right, we could talk about this forever, which we will not, but we could. <laughs> the last thing I will add is I really do just see EMDR as a tool, right? The EMDR is not saving people, right? It is, this is, it's an avenue, it's a tool that helps us lead people towards truth, lead people towards God, lead people towards scripture with the help of the Holy Spirit, like you said. Um, and I think that that's, yeah, a really helpful way to think about it. Um, and always going back to, you know, the work that both of both you and I do, like we both of us do that biblical counseling work. Right. Um, and I, you know, going back to your restory group, um, I'm going to post a link for more information um, for that in the comments. I have heard really, really wonderful things about this group from people who have taken it in the past of just uh, being a place to process um, trauma stories, people's trauma stories in, in community, um, with someone who's going to clearly, you can see, lead you through slowly and carefully <laughs> in a way that is, that is safe in a way that, um, you know, leads you back to truth, um, leads you towards healing. So I will, um, yeah, post a link, a link to that resource in the, in the comments. And I'll also post a link to our, um, to my counseling practice, um, Christian trauma counseling. We do provide, um, trauma care for people who are looking for a biblically faithful trauma-informed approach to counseling. Um, and so those are two resources that you can um, look into if you are looking, um, looking for help. So thank you again so much, Melissa, for having me. This has been a really um, a really fun conversation and I'm just, just glad to be able to mm -hmm. just kind of have an open discussion about this. Me too. Thank you.